Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. They say that um, presenting is like going to the dentist for me. Um, it's the one thing you hate, but you know that one day you're going to have to do it, right? Um, I've been through uh, dentist appointments in the last couple of weeks, so I know exactly what I'm talking about. But I was very excited when Dion phoned me and asked to present um, at this conference, mostly because I've had some time over the last two years to really re reflect. Uh, some of you know me from previous um, employers where I was leading the automation and uh, manufacturing systems business um, for a large international company. And about two years ago, I decided I've had enough. Um, I've had enough of the hype. And I think as I talk to many customers, I keep on getting that sense of, you know, is this real? What is it going to make difference in my life? And when I exited my previous employer, I had a restraint of trade for 18 months. That was awesome. Um, it gave me time. It gave me time to really go and research what this is about, what it should be about. And although that journey is an ongoing journey, what I'm presenting to you today is some of the key thoughts and lessons that I learned as I was thinking through this. Now, 18 months sounds like a tremendous long period, but actually it gave me an opportunity to, to learn new industries, industry segments, to build new networks. And it is very interesting to find how challenges repeat. They say there's very few things new in this world. And I hope that at the end of today, you'll think a bit different about your role in the much discussed hype of digital disruption. So let's start by, they say in school, at least that was my experience, I was one of the backbenchers, not the clever guys. Um, one of my worst things was when the teacher said I had to speech, right? Terrible. Probably just short second of that was when I walked into the class and the teacher said, today we are doing, anyone? What's that? A pop quiz. Yes, you're going to work. I'm not going to do all the work. Cell phones out, please. Everyone, cell phones out? Ready? OK. We're going to do some audience participation here. I want to get your views, your thoughts. So log on to www.menti.com. You're going to be asked to enter a password or a code, 720267. And you should be confronted with a fairly simple multiple choice question. I'm getting a couple of guys that's challenged by technology. Some is working, working? Try again. <laughs> what is that, a Samsung? <laughs> oh no, sorry, MTN. <laughs> um, okay, we're getting quite a bit of responses, okay. Four responses, not that much. Keep going. Hmm. I'll give you 40, min 40 seconds, not 40 minutes. That will make my life simple. Ah, I was just about to comment on the no idea. Hmm. Don't get influenced by other voters, please. Vote your conscious. So keep on going, but um, if I look at this, then there's quite a few of you that actually think that the concept of Industry 4.0 and whatever it is that you understand of it is potentially a fundamental game changer in your organization, your industry. 
there's um, nearly a quarter that is cynical like me <laughs> and think that it's a lot of hype. Uh, there they're starting to come now. Oh, we'll be 400 people. Where's the rest? Still struggling with connectivity. <laughs> you only get one choice. So let's move on. Fundamentally, if I look at it, and um, I'll keep it open for a bit, keep on voting. Um, if you haven't voted yet, you're only allowed one vote. It's a democracy, not a banana republic. So thank you. So quite a few of you, more than 60%, believe that the concept of Industry 4.0 is, is potentially a fundamental game changer for you. Now, I've got good news for most of you, except the about 10% that has no idea. Um, I'll have to come back to you a bit later. But whether you believe it is hype, or whether you believe it is a game changer, you are probably right. Either way. And that's not, you don't have to believe me. It's, it's cool if you believe me. But Sir Henry Ford, who was probably the grandfather of the second industrial, or one of the insightful people that exploited the second industrial revolution the best, said this. Whether you believe you can or whether you believe you can't, you are probably right. So do not underestimate the fundamental impact your attitude has towards whether you actually achieve the results or not. Now, let's move on for a moment. So if more than, and, and let's explore the scenario where the 60 plus percent of you that believes that Industry 4.0 is a game changer is right, okay? So I'm not saying the rest is wrong, I'm just saying let's play with that scenario. So 62% of you, if I remember the last number, believe that Industry 4.0 is a game changer. So if we go by Henry Ford, then you're halfway there. You're halfway to achieving a fundamental change in the way that we exist as humans on Earth. Because let's, let's get real a bit, right? We're talking digital disruption. We're talking industrial revolution. We, we saw earlier this morning the first three industrial revolutions. Fairly significant stuff, right? Powering industry from water and steam. Electricity. I mean, can you imagine the difference electric well, in Africa, in South Africa we could a couple of years ago, the difference that electricity makes, right? Um, these are real fundamental changes in how the world operates. So we are now in the fourth industrial revolution. We have access to more money than you can ever hope to spend. We have access to all the technology you can wish for in order to solve your problems. So why is it that we're not seeing disruptive change? Because honestly, most of what we're experiencing is small incremental improvement. At this point, probably, I've got a couple of you that goes like, and yeah, you don't know my finance manager. So I, I'm sure that a couple of you think that um, you know, whatever they're going to show you in the next two days, that's probably the 10% guys that, yeah. Um, you know, they don't have the technology. Technology doesn't exist to solve my problems. So, so let's do a quick phones. Oh, I promise this is the last time. Another pop quiz for you. Same site. This doesn't look right. Oh, you already moved on. So listen to the instructions this time before you go. <laughs> Give me two words. You've got place for two words. And the first one, choose whether you think funding or technology is the main challenge for you achieving your benefits from Industry 4.0. Type that in. In the second space, anything else you think is a problem. I give you 40 seconds again. Ignorance, love that. 
mindset, school. Remember the first one, funding, choose funding or technology. Hmm. Where's Dion? Dion, great news. I think you've got the technology. Technology is gaining some prominence. Oh, in this case, you can vote up to three times, so don't stop after the first one. Maybe someone triggers something. I love it. It's as if you're setting it up for me. This information will be available afterwards. I'll send it to whoever the organizer is, and they can share it with you. So keep on going, but um, I'm looking at results at the moment, and I'm going to call a winner. Um, seems like most of you are really concerned about funding. And good news for the rest of the two days presenters, they do not think technology is a problem. That is fantastic. Interesting mindset is right up there. So let's for a moment move to talking a bit about these two topics and just make sure that we're all on the same page. So I choose this slide. I want to talk to you a bit about the abundance of finance. And, and this blew my mind. It's probably a year ago when I listened to someone that knew much more about finance and world finance than me. And he made a statement to say, guys, there is more money in the world that's looking for a place to invest than what we can spend in 10 lifetimes. We had an innovation session and there was a young African guy that was, if I remember rightly, he was just, um, he was just winning, he just won the youngest innovator in South Africa award. And he stood up and he said exactly the same thing. He said, money is not an issue. The issue is, do you have a brilliant idea? Because if you have a brilliant idea, there is so many people that want to invest in that. So what this picture does is this picture tries to show you and for the deep analytics in you, which should be many of you, if you have a look at the fine print, you'll tell me it's outdated data. So it's about two years old. I apologize for that. Um, notwithstanding, if you look at this, a couple of interesting things. Number one, South Africa is not on the list. OK, maybe that's not that interesting. That's maybe a bit obvious. Number two that really jumped out at me was if you could see the, the GDP per capita, so that's the second number for each of these. It's interesting to see how that radically changed between countries where there's aging and reducing population versus growing population. So pick India versus Canada, if you want. What's closer? India versus the UK. GDP, hmm, ballpark roughly the same. GDP per capita, India. 1.7, UK 42, very interesting. So the fact I want to actually get to is the combined GDP of the 10, 10 largest economies in the world two years ago came to nearly $50 trillion. $50 trillion of goods and services that goes to consumers in a year. So those of you that's clever mathematically and economically will immediately go like, and yeah, that's got nothing to do with the amount of money that's available for me, right? True. The only thing I wanted to do here was to give you a proxy. A proxy to show you, compared to that, how big do you think the size of assets under management, and I'm talking financial assets, so investment funds, uh, pension funds, how does that compare to this number? Show of hands. Who thinks it's lower? $50 trillion 
dollars a year. Who thinks the amount of assets under management, financial assets, is lower than that? Hands? There's one, there's two. There's two, yeah, I think you're on the, the same, similar? Who thinks it's about similar? Who thinks it's fundamentally more? The rest of you don't think. So most think it is fundamentally more, and you're right. So the amount of financial assets under management, $150 trillion a year. Three times the size of the 10 biggest economies in the world. These are people sitting on money that they need to invest in order to make much more money. They will give you anything if you come up with the next idea that fundamentally change the way we operate. Okay, so, dealt with finance. Let's talk a bit about technology. Abundance of technology. So when I started this in true engineering fashion, um, I had to figure out a definition, right? So what is this thing? So I decided to go to the source of all information. Yeah, Google. So Google told me there were 150 million results for the search on Industry 4.0. Um, yeah, I don't know whether that's good or bad. <laughs> Frankly, just uh, you, you can't deal with that information. I couldn't deal with that information. So, okay, cool. Let's move to the next level of, of wisdom, Wikipedia. <clears throat> After spending quite a bit of time reading through the available information, I decided to go with a basic definition that I could find. So it is officially termed as the current trend in automation and data exchange in manufacturing technologies. Now, that sounds weirdly what we would say we've been doing, right, for the last X years, which includes some new hot technologies, Internet of Things, cloud computing, cognitive thinking and computing. So fundamentally, what this led me to was to say, well, this is about technology strategy, right? So industry 4.0 and how you really exploit that to gain a competitive advantage for your organization is ultimately about how you make choices regarding what investments to make and what to change in your business. So as I started to converge on that for myself, at least, I decided I'll do one last sanity check, just to make sure I'm on the right track here. So I went to the source of all wisdom, who is? I'm not going to pick on him because I know him too well. <laughs> who is? Dilbert. And I realized that even though we might have access to all the funding in the world, yeah, I know, it still blows my mind even when I say it out loud, right? And even though all the technology might exist, coming up with a real strategy that exploits in a disruptive fashion what is available today, maybe not that simple. So my journey continued. And I thought, well, okay, most of you, deep technical, so you probably don't believe me that the technology is available. Although the previous results actually showed you quite on, on track, so I'll skip over this quickly. Technology companies like the Schneiders, the Vivas, spending 900 billion rand a year on Industry 4.0 and related technologies. 900 billion dollars. I, you know, I'm an engineer. I cannot understand that much zeros. It's just, I, I, it's too much. Can you think for one moment, if I give you a fraction of that money, can you think that there's a problem that you cannot solve? Do you think with this amount of, inf of, of investment going into technology, do you really think there's a technology problem out there that they won't be able to solve? Maybe not today, but tomorrow. So I went a bit outside the norm, and I went to look at real interesting technology disruptions. So they say that by this year, <laughs> that's 2018, they'll be able to grow 
a hamburger patty in a factory for the first time, commercially. Now, forget about for a moment whether you want to eat it, whether you want to eat it. That's not the point. It will use one less than a percent of the land space that a herd of cattle for the same amount of meat will take. Now, we're talking of two real problems here, right? One, feeding a growing population. Number two, access to land, which we all know is quite uh, emotional at the moment. It will use less than 4% of the water that it takes to get the same hamburger patty through a herd of cows on your table, and about 40% of the energy. This is really fundamental, right? And I, I know you, you'll, be, you'll be listening to um, someone that's brave enough to sign up for a Mars exploration at the end of this. That, that, that's a real alternative, right? Because you can't take a cow with you. Um, this can work. So it solves some real problems. They predict that by next year, the first fully autonomous commercial available vehicle will hit the roads. Again, don't talk about whether you want to do this in South Africa or not. But the prediction is that it will reduce by 90% road accidents and deaths by road accident. A fairly serious problem. Well, less so in South Africa, but if you start to look at the, the trends in India and China, that is hundreds and thousands of lives that could be saved. That is fundamental. Last one, where's my mining colleagues? Where's mining? Mining, hands, hands. Difficult world, eh? These guys, 2025, they predict, the first commercial exploitation of mining on asteroids. You can go and search for it, go and research it. Now, you think it's difficult to mine three kilometers under the Earth. Hmm. Now, let's for a moment just look at these and, and go back to my, my core question. You've got all the technology. Well, it certainly seemed to, if there's a real fundamental problem that needs addressing. So if you can come up with the next bright idea, the technology, these guys that's investing 900 billion per annum, they'll find a solution for you. So what's the problem? Why is it that with all of these constraints checked, we really struggle to achieve the type of results that you would like to see in an industrial revolution. I'll take you back again. Water and steam, electricity, the first computers. And when you're looking at us today, I would say we're at the top of our game, right? I, I, I would say that as, as humans and as civilizations, we can achieve probably whatever we set our minds to. And it was interesting for me in the, in, in the second pop quiz, mindset came up quite a lot, and I, I guarantee you I don't rig it. It's not, it's not how I operate. I think the real problem is that today's institutions really has no interest in changing the status quo. It's comfortable, it's predictable. Yet we're not solving the real fundamental problems. If you look at stock markets even, stock markets keep on underperforming, except here and there maybe. Percentage of people living under the bread line continues to increase. Unemployment continues to increase. These are real, what we term in our organization, wicked problems. Problems that really need solving. But if you go and look at the companies today, then the status quo gives them guaranteed results, guaranteed returns, more so than disruption. So my question is really, what is it going to take for you 
to be disruptive. To really start to think about what is the real problems that needs fixing. Not how we make better things, but how we make things better. So, when I thought about this <laughs> for quite a time, I actually came to the conclusion that the answer, and <laughs> how does one of my, one of the guys that I listen to a lot in terms of management coaching says it's time to lose a client. So, <laughs> shoot me, hate me, but this is what I believe. The answer probably is not in this room. We are not diverse enough. We are of a certain age. We are of a certain thinking style which do not love risk. If you're fundamentally risk averse, you're not going to be the people that disrupt. The answer probably lies in some of your colleagues that's resigned in the last two years. People that just get irritated by corporate nine to five jobs and all the red tape around that. The answer lies in the fringes of society, not in the in crowd. The answer probably lies with my teenage game playing son or your newborn child. So at this point, you can imagine taking a bit of a sabbatical, enforced as it may be, thinking through this and coming to this point of that journey, I said to myself, so what the hell? How can I make a difference? Can I make a difference? And the reality is for, and let me diverge for a moment just into some personal thought here. Those of you that really know me well would know that this is, this is exceptionally unnatural for me. Um, I hope I'm doing okay, but I hate being in front of people. Um, I hate engaging with people. <clears throat> Sorry. It is not in my nature. This is learned behavior. You can teach yourself to do nearly anything you set your mind to. So, in that sense, we really need to teach ourselves to become disruptive. We need to teach ourselves to become inquisitive again. Ask questions, not because you want to catch up the other person in something wrong, or defend your position, but ask questions because you truly want to understand the real issue. Because Charles, I think it's Charles Christman, said, it's really not difficult to find a solution to a problem once you truly understand it. I would say we need to really spend much more time understanding what is the next fundamental change that we need to do. Really understand the problem. Now, they say if you want to predict the future, the only real way to do that is to create it. So I'm coming back to if you want to predict this future in this volatile world, you need to disrupt. You need to start to think disruptive. So, I started to wonder about, okay, so what, what does that mean? I mean, I know a lot of disruptive people. Um, they, they, they really annoy me most of the time because they disrupt, in my opinion, for the sake of disruption. But being an engineer, I tried to become a bit more specific about it. And as I started to look at the boundaries and the assumptions that we've been taught to just accept as irrefutable truth, I went down a bit of a rabbit hole in terms of how we got ourselves ensnared in a situation where 
in the name of standardization and best practices, we've really pigeonholed ourselves to the point where we cannot be sustainable in the long run. If you think about disruption and the opportunity that Industry 4.0 creates through technology, then I'm not interested in engaging in that discussion if you don't start talking about how this actually disrupt your industry. How does it start to disrupt the, the boundaries to competition? Because that's actually where this technology is starting to make the biggest impact. It's changing fundamentally the definition of your industry. It's changing fundamentally the definition of who your customer is, who your supplier is, if you can't think about how this is fundamentally changing your competitors and who you should think about as competitors, then I want to say that I think you're not actually applying your mind in terms of the opportunity and the risk that Industry 4.0 presents to you as an organization. So we're, in my mind at least, smack dead in the middle of strategic management, right? If your organization on a strategic level is not thinking about disruption and, and revolution as enabled through this technology, then I will go back to, I think it was Grant, who said the shortening of the life cycle of the S&P 500 global companies, right? This is what disruption do. If you're not gonna disrupt your business, then someone will do it for you. So, I thought let's look a bit practically about some of these. 20 minutes to go. So for, some of, for those of you who are wondering why I'm rambling on and on and on and I should have been finished, a couple of minutes ago, they gave me more time. So you stuck with me for another 19 minutes and 35, 34. So disrupt what? At the core of what we do, most of you, is products, right? So if you, if you, if you want to really make a difference through Industry 4.0, you've got to start to think about how you disrupt your products and how you deliver your products to your customers. If we look at the graphs, then we come into mass production, which is type of Industrial Revolution 2. So Ford, Henry Ford, you can have any Model T as long as it's black. That's mass, mass production, right? No options. You just take what I give you. End of the story. We got a bit cleverer. We moved into through personal computers, IT, PLCs, all the brave things, moved into the world of mass production, but with options. So we could get a bit more flexibility, a bit more freedom, you know, you can, you can choose some of the aspects of what you want. And I remember about 15 years ago, probably, Tom Peters, who is just one of those guys that I really, his insight is amazing, for me at least. He said, the future is about mass customization. If you cannot ca customize product at mass, then you will cease to exist in the future. Let's look at some of the examples of that today. Nike. Who has Nike products, hands? Not a lot. Probably because, how does Alan say? We were blessed with these bodies. Um, but you can go onto a website and design your own kit, right? They will make it for you. All right? Go to the shop and go and figure out which one hurts the least. They'll design it for you. Now, we're getting into furniture world. Exactly the same. Go and pick colors, materials, sizes to fit. <laughs> 
I can still see. <laughs> My screen is working. <laughs> to fit your requirements. Okay, we're back. Last example, cars, right? Go into a car web website, you design it for you. That's the concept of mass customization. Now, now for a moment, I know there's very different industries here, and probably the food and beverage guys and the automotive guys are closest to this reality. And we'll come back a bit to this concept in a couple of slides. Let's think a bit for a moment about what it would mean to your manufacturing operations if you needed to be able to deliver on this requirement. If you had to deliver on the requirement of mass customization, do you think that will make a difference in your client base? Do you think it will make a difference in how they buy from you? Do you think it will fundamentally make a difference in your competitiveness in the industry? Now, I'm guessing my mining colleagues is going like, and I do not know what you're talking about. Because <laughs> mining is probably way up the value chain, and the concept of make to order is, is really vague. Um, so I'm wondering. I don't have an answer. I, I, didn't, I didn't predict that I had answers for everything. So, first of all, think about product, what you do. Second of all, one of my other favorites, who knows this one, MBA guys, who's this? He doesn't know. He got, you, 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 you can Google it. <laughs> so, now he's distracted me so much that I forgot who it was. But I've got crypt notes. Crypt notes is an awesome thing. Michael Porter, my apologies to Michael. <coughs> Michael Porter said, you cannot add value to an organization if you don't add value to its core processes. This is, um, in my opinion, um, underscored, confirmed, reiterated by a thousand times by my loved IT colleagues who implement standard ERP solutions, right? Who's got a standard ERP solution in their business? Hands, standard ERP solution, few. It always boggled my mind a bit because by definition it says that there's no competitive advantage in those processes, right? Because if you've got the same process as the next guy, then it's just all the same, right? So if you want to make a real difference in your business, you've got to make a business in the core value chain. Inbound logistics, operations, outbound logistics. That is where you make a real difference. So if you think about disrupting, and disrupting for a competitive advantage, you've got to start there, right? Now, we shouldn't get too hang up about the physical product, right? Because that's what we've learned in the last couple of years. Examples, right? You all know these. Uh, no, you, yeah, there's one going. Good. So, it is, and, and that's what the last two years of learned has taught me as a guy that came from mining and metals to being exposed now to my brewing clients and my food and beverage clients, fast moving consumer goods clients. It is much less actually about the actual physical product and much more about the need of the client. What is the outcome they want? What do they want to achieve with your product? It's, it's, it's not about the bar of soap, right? They want to achieve something. And these companies have exploited that brilliantly, understanding what is it that the, that the customer actually want. And just look at how they have redefined their customers, right? How do they redefine the value chain? How you get to them, how you get services from them? How do they redefine operations, right? Fundamental change in thinking. So, I go to the who, where, what. I, I ended up with who, disrupt who. 
I said earlier, we're going to come back. Tom Peters, again, 15 years ago, went to China long before it was hype and the right thing to do and the interesting thing to do. And he came back and he said a phrase that has stayed with me forever. And he said, deaf to the middleman. If there is even one person between you and your end client, your end consumer, you've got to ask yourself, what are you doing? Because ultimately, the power at the end of the day lies with the individual that fronts the customer. If you're somewhere in that value chain, you've got to ask yourself, what value am I bringing? Why am I in this value chain? What am I fundamentally making a difference from the guy before me and the guy after me? Concept of crowdsourcing. This, is, this has blown my mind in the last 12 months. It's the concept of networks of professionals unaffiliated with each other. But if a client has a true problem, they pose it to the community, and the community will bring together the best team of specialists to actually resolve that specific problem. Solve the problem and go away again. This is the future for at least, in my opinion, all back office, all support functions, and on the other end of the scale, for the professions. If you start to look at um, consulting professions, you start to look at you know, the old professions in terms of attorneys, uh, you look at professions in terms of engineering fraternity, this is becoming a huge reality in their lives today. I can give you three websites after this presentation where you can log in, put your profile on it, and they will start using you when they have a problem that needs your specific specialized skill. Again, it's fundamentally changing the way that consulting firms work, right? And that's not Industry 4.0, but that's technology changing boundaries, changing behaviors. So let's bring it home a bit. I'm a very strong believer that in creating the roadmap of disruption and improvement in your organizations, there's a couple of fundamental truths. This picture should be known to most of you. S95, and you'll go like, and stand it, ha, got you. Yes, but you need to think about why you standardize something. You standardize something to create your unique way. You standardize something in order to create your secret source of how you compete. Not standardize like everyone else, that does not help. And here's the real trick. Once you've standardized, you need real strong leadership to make sure that this is religiously implemented in your organization. So a culture of performance and coherence. When you stabilize it, the next thing you need to do is to have the integrity to break it. So you standardize to stabilize, and once stabilized, you need to break it. Because if you do not break it, you cannot move to the next level of performance. Where do you start to standardize? And I'm preaching to hopefully the converted here. If you do not have predictable plant availability, you should stop everything else you're doing and focus on that. Without predictable plant availability, I'm not saying you need to be at the 80th percentile of OEE, but you need to be predictable. You need to know it's 60%, and it's 60% available for sure. So once you've achieved that stability, you can start to identify root causes and improve. But also that stability starts to give your production colleagues then the freedom to actually deliver against client expectations. So, point one, predictable plant availability. 
Point two, if you cannot accurately track and trace raw material, work in process, finished product, that should be your second priority. So again, production doesn't have a chance if they don't have control of predictable plant availability and actually what the quality of material is at each stage of the pipeline. Then at that point, you can start to get to the real clever scheduling, schedule adherence, quality control, quality management, and all the beautiful things that we normally sell senior executives. Because that's the things that they get exposed to, right? But if you don't have the discipline and the courage to start to focus at the right end of the value chain, I will guarantee you that you will not achieve sustainable results. Once you've progressed well on that journey, the real price, in my opinion, lies at the intersections. It lies at the intersections between planning, scheduling, and execution. It lies at the intersections between production and maintenance, maintenance, quality. It is when you start to break down these silos and change within those silos that you're starting to create real competitive advantage. So, You've got beautiful technology, and more than I think, we actually know how to handle. And technology, and specifically the inventions that triggered industrial revolutions, solved real important problems. So I'll ask you as you go through the next two days to really apply your minds to the problems you try to solve. Make sure it's a problem worth solving. Make sure it's a solution that's meaningful, that actually changes something, something fundamental. And it's interesting, but my son, who's fourth year engineering student and clever as you would just imagine, told me one day, they thought about it whether they could so much that they didn't think about whether they should. And I thought, Wow, that, that is actually really important. Yes, we could do a lot of things. But the question is, should we? So spend the next day and a half and really make sure that you apply your minds and the wisdom of humans to come up with problems that solves real world problems or solutions that solves real world problems. Thank you very much, everyone.